Hello, and welcome to episode 41 of the Power Score LSAT podcast. I'm Dave Kalorn in Napa Valley. And this is John Dinning in Los Angeles. You're in Los Angeles for now, but I hear you're going to be on the move <sighs> soon. Yeah, I'm always on the move, man. Uh, Fleet footed. I've got, uh, I'm going to San Diego tomorrow morning for a PGA event, the Torrey Pines, some golf tournament. I'll be what skiing. time do you tee off? Uh, what time do I tee off? <laughs> Whatever time they turn their backs. <laughs> Whenever I can sneak on. Uh, no, I will not be playing. I may not even watch a golf shot, but I'll be down there drinking. Uh, and then I'll be in Boulder skiing the weekend after that. Denver for the Super Bowl. It should be fun. And then I've got to go to this extremely extravagant black tie charity event in Boston, which... Can I, Dave, if you'll indulge me for a moment, can I make a plug for, uh, it's the uh, Corey Griffin. Wait a second. Yeah. Aren't I already indulging you? Well, more or less always. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Corey Griffin Foundation. Uh, he's the guy who started the Ice Bucket Challenge for ALS. Research and hopefully cure. Uh, I strongly encourage you to donate, uh, to contribute what you can, if you can. Um, buy our books first, but any leftover money, send it to the Corey Griffin Foundation for ALS. Um, he, unfortunately, is a buddy of mine. He passed a few years ago jumping off of an ice cream shop roof into a tributary in Nantucket, which is just the worst sentence I've ever said. It's weird. Yeah. I must admit. He broke two vertebrae and drowned, and it's I, a hundred friends of mine have jumped off this stupid roof. I will do it as soon as I get a chance. But That's he, the dumbest uh, thing I've ever heard. I doubt that. Because you've known me a long time. <laughs> it's up there. Yeah. Geez, somebody died doing this, so I'll be doing it as soon as possible. I jumped off a 70-foot cliff in Costa Rica that even the Costa Ricans were yelling at me to please just climb down. Uh, so, yeah, no, I've, I've taken my chances. But, yeah, unfortunately, Corey, uh, he passed, he drowned. And great guy. I'll be there in Boston in three weeks, I guess. Two, three, somewhere. And one of your friends is actually in charge of the entire... Um, his company, uh, David Dingman, his company is a sponsor of the event. So he's got, nice. he's got me at his table. And yeah, it's going to be quite a good time. I've just got to figure out uh, what color velvet suit to wear. Dark purple, baby. You think so? Oh, uh, yeah, always. If you're going to wear velvet, purple's the way to purple go. Purple velvet. All right. Uh -huh. and what would Prince do? Exactly that. <laughs> yeah. What uh yeah, what goes well with Lake Minnetonka? There you go. All right. Purifying yourself in the water of Lake Minnetonka. <laughs> you realize that Before nobody we get to in music, the audience. No, no yeah. one knows what in the world we're talking about. Right? So now I have to explain that. Uh in the movie Purple Rain, Prince talks about uh you have to purify yourself in the waters of Lake Minnetonka. I went to Minnetonka High School, so obviously we're quite proud of that. I did. And I Prince did. lived in the next community over from me. He lived in Chanhassen in his big purple house. Yeah. So yeah, you'd hear stories about him showing up on his motorcycle at all sorts of different places. Serving pancakes, playing basketball. If Dave Chappelle's was, to be believed. He was definitely playing some hoops, man, in those high heels. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Shirts and blouses. <laughs> so, what are you drinking today in um, advance of all your travels? Well, yeah, in uh, continuance of a dinner I had last night with a bunch of people down in Manhattan Beach, I am, uh, I'm still on the Casa Azul tequila train. Um, a big, beautiful, apparently handmade, as they say it, bottle, and it's great. It's great. It's I, good. It's Reposado. I highly recommend it uh, if you don't want to get anything done. It's you a, know it's what a wonderful Reposado way to kill actually, a day. <laughs> it is a good day. Yeah. Do you know what Reposado actually means? Um, Reposado? Mm -hmm. I, I assume it's Mexican for regret. But <laughs> <laughs> Spanish, <laughs> I think, is the right, word that right, you meant. Okay. That could just be my experience. I've got so many stories from last night that I am not allowed to tell in a PG-13 podcast. Maybe we'll do an after show and hear all should. about it. Maybe we should. Reposado is the aging of the tequila. Okay. So, it means so it's been aged in barrel Blanco for like, and Anijo and Reposado. Yep. It's somewhere up to a year, but I don't believe more than a year. So, that's your tequila fact yeah. for the day. Thank you. And I can I just apologize to anyone listening that I've just called the Spanish language Mexican. That, <laughs> I already regret yeah. that so much. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the right, tequila is well, Mexican. The language is Spanish. Yikes. Thank you. Yeah. From the agave plant. From the agave plant. 
Yeah. Well, I'm not drinking tequila as usual. <laughs> I'm very rarely drinking tequila. But it's been so cold and rainy here, which I think describes, at least cold, describes most of this country in the last week. But what I'm drinking is a sea breeze. Oh. Yeah, I like kind that. of just like wishing for summer, man. I, w- I would really like things to warm up. I'm tired of this overcast weather, seasonal affective disorder, <laughs> bothering everybody. The LSAT taught me that. There's something about and, that uh, drink that's optimistic in a way, if that makes there sense. There really is. Yeah. And I like a vodka cranberry in general. Mm-hmm. I think it's a really good mix. This is obviously, that's like the base of it. So I think you throw in some grapefruit juice, which I typically don't like, but this has got a very summery feel to it. Yeah, anytime I'm, I hear somebody drinking a sea breeze, I'm like, he's dreaming of better days. That's what I. <laughs> that's just what I immediately, like, instinctually think. If that's what you're dreaming of, shouldn't you be drinking sex on the beach or something? <laughs> <laughs> well played. Um, <laughs> if I left you speechless, <laughs> <laughs> well, for once. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I, again, I want to tell you a story about last night, but <laughs> I don't think it ended nope. that way. Uh, I didn't. From what I've heard, no, it didn't. Um, and for another time, another time, we'll have to find out about it when we get our next update on your love life. There was no, there was no beach. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's enough. So let's transition very quickly, <laughs> abruptly. Yes, to, run. Yeah, run. Um, <laughs> to some music. A great song, one of my favorite songs. Uh, an interesting, almost controversial song in a way, if you understand like the underlying history of it. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Somewhat, yes. Okay. Um, I don't know how controversial I find it. Controversial in the fact that it led to one of the earliest copyright infringement lawsuits over music. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. You want to tell people what it is? I certainly do. Uh, It's a song called Under Pressure, uh, which is a collaboration between the group Queen and the legend belated David Bowie. Um, Magnificent David Bowie. Yeah, the magnificent, the... um, in the middle, like, like he's incredible, uh, but yeah, Queen and David Bowie. But that little riff at the beginning, the doom 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 doom, it was um, repurposed for a less uh, wonderful song. Although the first cassette tape I ever bought, there you go, true confession, <laughs> Vanilla Ice. I didn't, I didn't know this. I know. I'm really enjoying the first this. concert I ever saw was New Kids on the Block, and the first cassette tape I ever bought because I was a kid with cassettes was Vanilla Ice. My God, the I mockery know. that I will make of this. Get it. Get You're it. Dead. I deserve it. No, it's, I look, <laughs> I lay myself out. For this. <laughs> I deserve it. I had a very, very disreputable start to a musical career. It's not good, to be honest with no, you, I must not. say. No, it's, we, my sister made a New Kids on the Block quilt. It was just bad. Holy crap. I know. <laughs> I know. <A> quilt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Donnie and Marky and all of them. It it's pure dedication. Oh, yeah. oh there man. You there you go. When, now, now you've learned a thing. When people like cross stitchy stuff or quilt or, or things like that, you know that they are really into it. That means that's a true sign of fandom. Um, no one's given me a quilt yet. Hmm. I don't think I've made it like uh, like Joey. You need to make it a priority to get yourself a quilt, but <laughs> All right. the well, reason that we've chose that yeah. song, chosen, <laughs> is that we're talking about reading comprehension today, and we're talking about what we call skill tests, mm-hmm. but you could just as easily call them pressure tests, and what we're going to talk about is what happens when you put your reading comprehension performance under pressure, and what can you learn from it? Now, I think the, um, the really notoriety... under scrutiny, as I, as I see it. Like, this is what this sure. is. It's, this is like a, a microscope of sorts. Yeah, and we'll talk about it when we get to it. But that riff that you're talking about, which is very famous and Vanilla Ice had uh, taken it, he ended up getting sued over it. And if I'm wrong about the details here, you go ahead and correct me. God, I just had his cassette, man. I don't know the details, but go ahead. And I don't know what to say in response to that <laughs> sentence. <laughs> it's just difficult for me to follow with a coherent thought uh, yeah, other I than just, laughter. I just, <laughs> I just had his cassette. Uh, uh, I've actually seen him on like some home channel, like rebuilding houses. He's a pretty cool dude. Is that what he's doing now? Arthur yeah, Van he's Winkle? he's actually good was, at it. Isn't that his name? 
Yeah, he's really he's really into it. But anyway, nice. he took that riff, he put Ice Ice Baby over it. It was a massive smash. And then, of course, uh, the lawyers for Queen and Bowie came after him and said, you just took our song and sampled it and you gave us no credit. And his initial response was to deny that he had done so. And if you compare the two, you will know immediately that that was a lie. And he said, I added an extra beat in there, I've which seen he this, did. I've seen this interview. Yeah. yeah, there's like an extra note. And then later on, after he had lost and actually lost, uh, I think, all the credit to the song, I think it's now listed as a, a, a Bowie Queen thing, but oh, maybe his name it. is still on it. He, uh, he came back and said, and he said, I was joking about that. Um, that. He changed his defense afterwards. But anyway, for all you aspiring lawyers out there, you can go look that up because that was part of the original set of... Uh, lawsuits, and there were a number at this time about sampling music, and this had a really big effect on the rap community mm. in terms of like what was being able to be sampled and how much you had to pay for it because the fees began to be in the millions, even if you just sampled like two to three seconds of a song. Yeah, it continues to actually permeate. Like um, Pharrell and Robin Thicke, I think, had yep. to pay millions to uh, Marvin Gaye's family for essentially blurred lines. That's it. They blurred the lines too much, and then <laughs> yeah. they ended up with the Those lines there. were not as blurry as they thought. <laughs> not to the court. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's move on. Let's get into the LSAT world, which is very brief, actually. Um, as is their want near the middle of the month, they have released a new podcast. Podcast number 15 for them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Keeping Up to Data, as usual, for January of 2020. Clocks in at a massive 5 minutes and 41 seconds. Killing it. Yeah, they're no longer doing the two-minute thing. Ever since I gave them that criticism, <laughs> they listened. Yeah, honestly, I mean, not to give you too much credit because your head will explode those headphones, um, but it does seem like they have listened to this. You said bulk it up, and literally the next week, it's been twice as long or more. Well, the nice thing is, and I really like it when they provide hardcore data. Right. I think that's the most useful thing. I would love to see them explore that even more. I was reading the transcript of this podcast, and and Susan Krinsky, who's the, the reader for this one, had put in the address. And I was like, I think I might write her. And I was going to start off the, the email with like, hey, Susan, it's Dave over at PowerScore. I know I'm not your favorite person, but... <laughs> <laughs> See if I can ingratiate myself lead. with her yeah, that's a good before lead. asking for more super data that they have. Because, you know, they're sitting on troves of this that I would love to know about. Yeah. Let's, what was the most interesting data to come out of this to you? Because I, I certainly have a perspective. Why don't, why don't we go through it? Okay. Because I think there's about four or five pieces that are really interesting that are really kind of like short bites. Cool. And uh, we'll just see what we get. And then when we get to that part that you like the most, we'll debate whether or <laughs> well, not Well, it's going it to be early, I think, because it's like the most staggering, like standout moment, which was the January 2020 test. Exactly. Yeah. So they know that there were about 18,400 people who were, I think, sat for it. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing was when I went back in our records and I looked at this, I was like, boy, that's a lot less. At least according to the information that we have, they had previously stated that they had 24,000 plus registrants for that test. Yeah. Which means if only 18,000 and change ended up taking it, they lost a quarter. Yeah. 75% of the people took it, but 25% didn't. That's a huge number of uh, non-attendees, I suppose I could call it. It's a really high attrition rate. Exactly. And so I would love to have uh, maybe heard a little bit more of their thoughts on why that might be the case. But I understand they very rarely talk about motivation and reason, and they're not in the opinion providing business. They're in the, this is what happened, and this was the percentage. Yeah. So I realize that they're constrained by that. And Susan, just know that there's no criticism from me to you over that particular <laughs> you know, lack. There you go, but Susan. if you wanted to change your mind and get into it and start saying, well, we think it happened for this. <laughs> yeah, but I'll mean share more. In the meantime, we'll speculate. Um, but I, I, if I had to guess at, at some of what these numbers tell us, it's either that November scores came out more favorably for people that were signed up for January than they had maybe expected, or they realized they were going to need to take a later test and spend more time preparing. And honestly, you and I have talked about this a lot. I cannot recommend that enough. If you can raise your score one or two points for a later test, take a later test. 
I knew a lot of people had signed up for January as kind of like, let me have this in my back pocket just in case. So I think we lost a lot of people to that. For sure. And that's completely reasonable. If, if you did fine in November, and November was a really reasonable test, you've discovered it, and now you're like, nah, I don't need to take January. Congratulations. I have nothing but like happiness for you. I know November was a test like that for a lot of people. We talked about it. It was a really reasonable, to use your word, test. Yeah. The next piece of data that they threw out there was that so far in their cycle, which is typically June all the way through the following uh, May. May, they say that so far they've administered just over 115,000 tests, and there's still three more to go between now and April. Last year, the total test takers, total, not at this point, so not a year-to-year comparison, but uh, a total was 138,000 and a couple hundred. So they think they're going to go above that. But interestingly enough, and this is something we've talked about before, even though more tests are being administered, the total number of applicants is actually down. Mm -hmm. And so applicants this year are actually down 1.8%. And some of you, I imagine, are like, what did he just say? Like, that didn't make a lot of sense. There's fewer people by a small fraction, 1.8%, applying actual applicants. However, the number of tests that they're taking is greater or equal to, at the very least, to last year. So you have fewer people taking more tests. Right. And this is repeat culture, where somebody's like, all right, I got a 159, I want to do better, and they repeat the test, and they go out, and hopefully that's what happens. And maybe they say to themselves, I still left a few points on the table, and they go back in and do it again. Yeah. I think this is going to change a little bit over the next two years, maybe over the next 12 months, because of the repeat limits that have been uh, imposed. But for now, yeah, that's exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing the scales kind of shift in a different direction than people would expect. That's exactly right. And um, also that July test had a wave of repeaters come through it. Yes. So that's contributing to this as well. And it'll be really, it's tough to use this last year as any kind of like baseline or marker because of that. Next year, we'll start to see what the reality looks like going forward. But for now, we're still dealing with anomalies that are pretty difficult to, to handle. They did do something here that I didn't love, and this has become a very much of a trademark shocking, of LSAC. Shocking. <laughs> they to do, said, to yeah. do things you don't love? <laughs> Again, <laughs> I'm always quick to provide advice for them. Yes. Hopefully they listen. I'm usually right when it comes to like, I hey. Know, I know they the listen. I don't know that they hear. I don't think they like. Mm. They don't like to listen. But <laughs> they, they do this all the time. They say applicants are currently down 1.8% as compared to last year. All right? That's a fact. And then they always try to make it nice and shiny, but up 3.5% as compared to two years ago. There is always spin on what they're saying. And I understand the, the desire to do that, but you know, I've talked to other people in this field and we all know what you're doing. You don't need to do it. It's, some things are not your fault. You can't control the number of applicants if it's down or up. Not everything has to be shiny news for the law schools. Right. To be honest, the fact that the number of applicants is down slightly, that's really good for applicants. So you can spin it that way if you want. Better for applicants, maybe not so great for law schools. And I realize that law schools are their big primary client and the rest of us are mm, secondary. (laughs) Well, look, it's hard to legislate the appeal, the public appeal of a legal career, right? It's like, how do you convince people that this is a good profession to get into. That's really tricky to do. So sell your test. Stop with the, you know, the the smoke and mirrors, the used car lot game of like, oh, but you're really going to want this one. Stop it. That's exactly right. The next piece of information was something that has been trending recently. And they pointed out, they talked about this last month, the applicant volumes in the three highest ranges, and that's 165 to 170, yeah. 171 to 175, 176 to 180. So the top 15 points, roughly. It's probably 166 to 170. That's it. They are up compared to last year. So even though you can say there's slightly fewer applicants, the number of people coming into the application season with higher LSAT scores, that's greater than before or 
You know, it's something that is rising. And what that means is when you're sitting there and if you're thinking to yourself, all right, I want to go to, say, a T14 school um, or a T6 or a T3, there's there's more people out there than there were previously with high scores. And that puts a real – it's an imperative on you to say, I've got to go out there and do whatever it takes. And we often talk about this that whether – and you just mentioned it actually. Mm. A one-point increase can be easily worth it, not just from an admission standpoint and then future earnings, but also from a financial package. So if you need to take a course to do that, yeah, their course is expensive. But if you spend $1,000 and it brings you $10,000 in scholarships – what you just did was you didn't make an expenditure, you made an investment. Yeah. And that's the same thing with tutoring or what have you. It's like, put the time into this. I think a lot of times people don't realize the financial calculus that's involved in LSAT scores and GPA, which is unfortunately for most people fixed or right. largely fixed, and what you get offered by the law schools. You don't need to pay as much as other people if you can go out and add a point or two and in the long run, that'll benefit you far more than the thousand dollars in your pocket, typically. Yeah, I mean, it's a, a tricky calculus to, especially from our end, because obviously it seems a bit mercenary for us to talk about this stuff. But the truth is undeniable that you spend a little bit of money to really make a lot of money. I'm going to take issue with that description By as mercenary, all means. and I'm I mean, probably not going to fight you too hard on it because I'm, I'm in a way, sort of. I'm trying to downplay our role as, as salespeople because uh, that's not well, really what I see us as. I see we're us not. As, as I think what you're looking at is you're like, I feel bad. This is what we do. And then right. to say to people, hey, you should make use of the, the classes that we offer, the tutoring or the books that we offer, what have you. But if you were a chef and you had a three star Michelin restaurant, you'd say to people, Yeah, come come to my restaurant. It's really good. But the difference here is is that you might go to a three-star Michelin restaurant and pay $1,000, but then have the opportunity to maybe get twenty or $30,000 back. It's a far better deal if you take a class like this than going to a Michelin three-star that's, restaurant. That's very fair. You're going to pay me to eat? All right. <laughs> yeah, it's not mercenary. I've come to a point of thinking to myself that it's just fundamental, obvious logic. Yeah. I, and the I, optics of it to me sometimes I think can be perceived as mercenary. That's what I really meant. Is you like, don't want to be closely associated with promoting something that you actually provide. It I feels get that. gross to me. But yeah. at the same time, it's such an obvious, smart investment. If you can raise your score two points, it's probably worth literally five figures. Yeah. And oftentimes, yeah, and and so it's like, well, I'm gonna get your score up way more than that. What's holding you back? But at the same time, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think I've been frustrated by. I, I, I talk to a lot of people, obviously, about this, and I know. I keep running into people I just, like I, I picture the guy in the cheap suit. What do you walk? And it's like, dude, don't. Like, I get airbags are important. Like, I'll I'll buy the car I want. Like, leave me alone. It's, you know? Yeah, I, it, it's too many people that I've talked to are like, well, this is what I did and I, I, you know, I should have probably spent more time or maybe I should have done this and this is my LSAT score, but I don't know if I can deal with this debt. And that goes for people who are already lawyers too. That's true. Yeah. And I'm like, man, this whole thing is set up so at the beginning of the process, if you make right and smart decisions, you can take care of all those future problems. Yeah. You should not be paying full price for law school under any condition yeah. unless you're like, look, I really want to go to Yale and I'm not going to get money or Harvard or whatever the case may yeah, the be. The sticker's worth it at that point, maybe. Yeah. Um, but you you know this, and not to go too far down this little rabbit hole, but um, I, I train a lot of our instructors who are coming through and preparing to teach students. And I train a lot of our tutors. And one of the things I always say to tutors is like, look, when people are deciding what tutoring package to buy, the one thing I never hear from students, I, I don't think to this day I've never ever heard, maybe you have, but I doubt it, is I wish I'd done less. I wish I'd studied less or spent less time talking to you or, God, it's too bad I spent all that time looking at circular games. Well, no one has ever said that to me. What I hear instead, daily, multiple times, I wish I'd done more. God, I wish I'd looked at pattern games one more time or I wish we'd had one more session or I wish I had another week before this test because I just am I'm terrified that a mapping game might pop up or I really need to look at assumptions. Again, that's what I hear. Um, yeah. 
all the time. Constantly. I mean, wish that I'd is... studied harder, wish I'd studied longer, wish I'd studied more, wish I'd used more tools, yeah. wish I'd taken a course, wish I'd done tutoring. That's the refrain, man. And so when I hear that and think about the applicability of what we're talking about right now, it's always the sense of like, just invest. Well, if you look at it as an expenditure and something that's like, I have to do this, then it feels like, oh man, I'm taking money out of my pocket. An investment does not feel that way. An investment feels like, all right, it's going to come back to me later. And that's why these, you know, all these options that we're talking about, whether or not it's with us or somebody else, these are investments in your future. If you see it from that perspective, the decision-making process becomes a lot easier and you get a lot more engaged and involved. Yeah. In we sell the world's best boomerang. <laughs> Financial. Right. <laughs> anyway, the last uh, – you said you didn't want to go too far down that uh, rabbit hole. And then we what happened. Yeah, no, we're, <laughs> we're subterranean, but by all means. Yeah, the last fact that they threw out in that podcast, because amazingly we're still talking about their podcast – was um, about Canada. And it says applications in Canadian in Canada for Canadian law schools are up 6.5% and applicants, the actual people, mm-hmm. up 2.4%. So in Canada, things are actually on the rise. In the US, it's a little bit different in terms of how it is. And again, adjust your expectations accordingly. When there's more people applying, your chances are lowered incrementally. It's more competitive. Now, if yeah. you have the numbers, you're still getting in. So, you know, that's not, it doesn't mean all of a sudden that somebody with a 178 and a 395 <laughs> is in trouble. They are not. But there you go. That is the keeping up to, keeping up to the data. And there you honestly, go. they did yeah. a good job. They filled it with a lot of good data, in my opinion. A deeper dive into the LSAT world than I intended, but here we are. Sometimes you just gotta. Sometimes you gotta. Let's get to the heart of the matter. Let's do it. All right. This um, has been a long meandering introduction. <laughs> yes. And now we're about to get into what I know is just one of your absolute favorite talking points, reading comprehension. Parts of it, definitely. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I say that a little tongue in cheek, uh, but not entirely facetiously, because this is a more interesting part of the test than I think people give it credit for. True. And also, you and I are big readers. So uh, this is something I think that a lot of times we feel inherently comfortable with. So sometimes talking about it might feel like, all right, uh, less exciting, but that's not the case. I think with this, this is actually something that is really unique. And what we're going to talk about are what we call skill tests. Yes. I use the, I use the phrase pressure test before, uh, stress test. I think you had said something to the effect of like, it's a, it's a diagnostic of sorts. I think so. And I agree with that. These are these are ways to diagnose how it is that you're performing and whether or not you have areas that require improvement. So if you're out there hitting 27 out of 27 on every prep test, this is probably not going to be the most illuminating thing. Find a different episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go look for your weakness. <laughs> right. However, if you are, you know, 23 out of 27 or 13 out of 27 or even 5 out of 27, whatever the number actually is, we're going to talk about various things that you can run yourself through, tests that you can put yourself through that will help you actually figure out, well, maybe this is an area that I need to focus on. And, you know, we were talking about this beforehand and I said to you, this is to me is a lot like bank pressure tests or bank stress tests. Mm -hmm. And I was an econ major at Duke. So anything that's economically oriented is at least to me somewhat interesting. But in a, in a, you know, in the worldwide banking system, one of the things that they will have banks do, and especially in the United States, since the great recession has gotten a lot more popular is they will go into a bank and they will start running it through computerized scenarios. Mm -hmm. And what these scenarios do is they alter the variables in the economy, within the bank even, various things. So, for example, they might go into a bank and they they might look at the portfolio and then they're going to say, let's start running a simulation of what would happen if there was uh, a major market collapse in Russia that then started bleeding over into China and then the world economy went down like 5%. And then they'll see what happens to the assets in the portfolio of the bank to see whether or not the bank would be able to stay afloat. Yeah, withstand it. 
Yeah. Or what would happen, essentially. Yeah. Or would they run out of money and then all of a sudden fail? And they might do that in a really broad scale, like I just described. They might say it's something really local, like, you know, the southeastern portion of the United States experiences severe weather and it economically cripples the region for right. a yeah, period of months. Yeah, Midwestern grain prices decrease by 2%. What's going to happen to our yeah, futures? Yeah. So it might be something relatively small. It might be incredibly severe. And what happens is, is in the aftermath, they look at how the bank would have performed in that scenario, and then they recommend changes. Like you need to diversify your portfolio, or your cash holdings aren't enough. You would you would actually go under. And people don't often think about banks going under, but when they do, it is obviously uh, a serious business. And so the pressure testing of banks is a lot what we're, you know, kind of like the analogy to me as to what we're going to do with reading comprehension. We're going to have you change the parameters of how you study certain things and the actions that you take in order to see how you perform. And then on the basis of that, we'll have further insight and we will then be able to say, all right, that tells us this, this is what you should do, or this is where you should take it. So I think kind of an interesting exercise um, and the more of these tests that you run through and the more passages that you try with them, the better off and more informative it's going to be. If you do each one of them a single time, that's nice. It's not going to be hugely informative because you might have gotten lucky or you might have had a really bad, you know, passage kind right. of situation Just an for off yourself. Day. Right. Yeah. But these are all designed to be used on passages you've never seen before. So you're going to burn some. <laughs> that's okay. There's, there's hundreds of them. Most people never get through right. all of them or even half of them or even 25% of them. So we can burn a few. And if you're like, I don't want to burn one of the recent tests, which I'm 100% supportive of, go back further. Sure. It doesn't matter whether you do this on prep test three or prep test 30 or yeah, prep 83, test 63. Yeah. yeah, I don't care. Um, let me make an ancillary sort of concession to this too. I think it just makes the whole process a little more fun. What I hear from people constantly is that reading comp is the most boring thing to prepare for on this test. And I am fully in agreement with that. It's my least favorite section. You're really selling this hard. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm doing a great job right now. <laughs> um, but to me, being able to run reading comp through different optics, through different lenses, at least gives it a sense of dynamism, if you follow me. Like it, it, I do. It's something that allows it to be a little bit more dynamic, a little bit more animated, a little more um, unique each time you have to go through one of these sections. And I cannot overstate the value of that, frankly. Well, that probably brings up a secondary point. It's funny, you said ancillary, and I was like, I usually said that word ancillary. Oh, oh. So, that's another, another. Senescence. <laughs> I don't trust you with word pronunciations <laughs> any longer. Uh, Not after last time. I know. I, I, I'm I do a, want to make a point about the unique. Mutt. It's not my fault. That's true. Yeah. I, I do want to make a point about the uniqueness that I think is really critical is these tests that we're talking about, John and I invented them. They're exclusive to power score. Mm -hmm. No one else is doing this. This is a very unique thing that we're able to use with our students to say, let us really see where your performance on reading comprehension is strong and where it's lacking. And this is the kind of cutting edge stuff I think that we really enjoy is like creating new things, new ways to actually analyze how people perform. This is a good example. You don't see a whole lot of that in reading comprehension. Most people just ignore it. Exactly, so. yeah. Reading comp has been a really static kind of endeavor for a lot of people, for a lot of companies for a long time. And I feel like you and I, at the very least, to self-congratulate, are um, trying our best to innovate. And this is one of the most innovative things that I think we've done. It's one of the most exciting things in the newest editions of the PowerScore Bibles that yep. you'll find. Um, it's one of the reasons that I strongly recommend people update. Don't read the 2015 or 2016 editions when we have this kind of content in the newest versions. I don't even think this is in like 2018, for, the, for no, example. No, this is like within the last two years, I think, these tests yeah. that we're about to describe. And we're probably just going to you know, blow the whole thing right now as we talk about it. But <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're giving away chapter just, nine or whatever. <laughs> yeah, this is just one dimension of it. Obviously, yeah. there's a written discussion of it. and. Uh, 
you know, to be honest, <laughs> this is the kind of thing we talk about in our courses as well. Sure. You did a, you created a clinic for this. I did. And clinics are something that we offer to our students usually like on Fridays, but they can view it at any point if, if they're not able to attend live. Yeah. Where we usually take a couple hours and go through some concepts in depth. That might be assumption questions. It might be reading comprehension pressure tests here. Exactly. But yeah. This is this is what we do. Supplemental and, content of the course, but things that I feel need a little bit of extra stress. That's what I kind of made the, the clinics about. And they're well, fun, I and I taught the majority of the first round. Yeah. They're great. Well, they're also hidden because you don't realize when you're a student who's yeah. signing up or you're kind of like comparing courses or like they have, you know, they have these things right. that Oh, I get 50 extra live, live and, hours of like extemporaneous conversation. Yeah, but you do. Yeah. It's great. Anyway, let's uh, let's get into it. What what's the first test you want to talk about? Are we there? I say can, we were. Can there. we be there? All right. All right. So this is what we call the broad versus detail reading test. I like this one. So obviously, when we call it the broad versus detail reading test, we're trying to see what your ability level is as you read through something to determine, you know, like the big picture elements, like main points and so forth, mm -hmm. as well as like the smaller details of the passage. And it isn't necessarily to say that one is better than the other. All right. That's not the point here. It's just to see how you're actually performing. So the first thing that we do is we want to go ahead and give you some extra time to go through this particular test. So you take a, a passage and the related questions. And again, it's something that you haven't seen previously. Figure out how many questions it has. Let's say it has six questions. Add five minutes to that. Mm -hmm. Now you have 11 minutes to do this particular passage set. So, you know, either track the time or set a timer for that. Read the passage. And uh, eventually you're going to do the questions. However... The problem is, is that once you finish the passage, remember you had 11 minutes to do everything, you can't look back at the text of the passage. You can only use your recall. So it's as if you read it, complete the reading of it, and that's it. Dismiss you, it. Exactly. You never look at the passage again. And this is to try to determine how well you're reading and what you're actually picking up. And so it's not so much a matter of speed, it is far more a matter of how well you're absorbing information and how well you're able to recall that. So to some extent, a short-term memory test, and it's just focused on uh, particular elements. So then you, you do the questions after having had, have done that. What happens then? It's all about performance. We want to go look at your answer choices and the problems that you got right and the problems that you got wrong and determine if there's any kind of patterns. Mm -hmm. So did you miss all the big broad questions? Global reference, for instance, yeah. Yeah. Or did you miss all the really specific detailed ones? It can be pretty tough to answer a specific reference question if you can't go back and look at the passage. Yeah. Which of the following did the author mention as evidence of? And it's like, oh, God. I know that I'm was in paragraph trouble. three, but what did he say? Yeah. yeah. So there's going to be questions that you miss. It's never about whether or not you miss questions. It's about whether or not you learn anything from that and what patterns you see. If we start to see that you keep missing main points on a test like this, then we know that you're not properly reading the passage to pick up those broad points as you go through this. Yeah, the forest for the trees moment is really what that is to me. Or you might start noticing that every time they talk about the subject's view – that you keep missing those problems. And you're like, I'm just not recalling that. Somehow I'm not separating that out as a piece of information that's notable. And notice, we're not telling you go back and look at your notes on the passage. That's a different test entirely that we'll get to. <laughs> this is about reading it. You can notate it, but you can't look at those notes again. So... Yeah, to me, what this really emphasizes, if I had to maybe draw this particular uh, exercise up in a, a single stroke or two, is are you reading for the big picture details? If you miss some specific questions, some you know specific reference or concept reference questions, fine. That doesn't bug me. But if you miss main point, if you miss tone, or which of the following is most analogous to how you would describe it? If you miss those kinds of questions, you're reading the passage the wrong way, and this test will tell it to you, and you've given yourself enough time with a plus five clock uh, to really establish those kinds of broad-based um, analysis. Well, the extra five minutes is really to see whether or not, you know, if you read it 
properly if you're actually looking for the right things. Yeah, let me add a footnote on this test too, because I've I've found that with students with five extra minutes, and that is generous, frankly, you cannot go through this test that way if you want to perform at a really high level. I have have whittled it down to three extra minutes. Questions plus three, questions plus one, questions minus one. And that's when you really, <laughs> really pushing yourself. Um, yeah, these are the post your first time yeah. trying it. And I say or all of you... this mostly to, to emphasize the fact that these tests allow for accommodation and modification. They allow for a degree of um, uh, personalization. I think. Yeah, and when you say tests, you mean the ones that we're talking about. The here, tests not that the, we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the you can tests. Tr you can try it under the original parameters, but in almost every instance in our materials and in our classes, what we talk about is go ahead and adjust it. Mm -hmm. If you're like, I didn't need that five minutes, be like, well, give yourself three instead. Or if you really think you're a true stud, <laughs> just do it on the straight time or do it minus one. And notice how we use the questions as the marker here. Yeah. So. Exactly. We use we use what we call the plus two timing system for most of reading comprehension, which is just the number of questions plus two minutes is about the rough amount of time that you have to go through it. Which makes sense. Four passages, 27 questions, 35 minutes. There you go. Yeah. It's nice and easy. So this is a really great way to get a good sense of, am I reading for the right things? Am I understanding the big picture elements? And when I miss those specific questions, because you're going to, why did I miss it? Was it because I just didn't properly focus or was it because a couple of good wrong answers? You can give yourself a little bit of latitude. You're not actually striving for perfection. If you can get it, fantastic. Right. But if you don't, that actually is really illuminating in yeah. terms of analyzing It's amazing what a mistake can inform you of. And I, I feel like people look at mistakes as just they they – immediately categorize them as failure and it's negative, but it's not. It's instructive. I wrote a whole blog post called The Benefits of Failure, yeah, so I'm man. right there with you. I've read it multiple times. All right, let's move on. Let's go to the next one, John. Sure. The diagramming test. Is that the next one you want to talk about? Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's a bunch of them in here. There's no particular order that we need to go through these, but um, this is something you and I have actually talked about before when we did our initial analysis of the new interface, the digital interface. We talked about essentially what it means in terms of the tools allowed or provided uh, for annotation and marking passages, text, period, in the, the digital platform. Um, my take on this is essentially what you need to understand is what is the right amount of diagramming for you? We even discussed this, Dave, when we talked about conditional reasoning. Should I diagram this or not? There's not always a black and white answer to that. The answer is different for everybody. Exactly. It's not always like quantitative. It's very qualitative. It's very you, personal. I don't diagram anything on this test. Games, but aside from that. You, on the other hand, you look like a CSI murder suspect <laughs> poster board. Like, <laughs> suspect. <laughs> there's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, you know. <laughs> push push pins and ribbons and and all yeah it's crazy you know like you're trying to track your you know your sister's murder or something but i my sister was I, not murdered i, I it's just for everybody listening yeah yeah sorry <laughs> that reminds me of an old joke um <laughs> i spent the last two years trying to find my girlfriend's killer but no one will do it <laughs> All right. <laughs> that joke's actually acceptable in the sense that you do not yeah, have no, a girlfriend. I don't. I don't actually. I killed her. Uh, <laughs> this is <laughs> this is essentially how much it is that you should notate <laughs> for reading comprehension. And again, there's no set amount. You and I are very different in this. Everyone should be different in this. But the only way to figure it out is through a test like this, which is essentially boils down to experimentation. All right. So explain the test. Right. Um, basically what you do, again, the number of questions plus two timing approach is what I would recommend that people use. Regular timing per se. Yeah, more or less. So seven questions, nine minutes, that kind of thing. Read the passage in its entirety. Make your normal marks and notes. As you move on through it, as you look at the questions and return to the passage, only look at the things you've marked. In other words, have a very discriminating view back on the passage. If there's a whole section of a paragraph you didn't touch, ignore it. You have to ignore it. 
It's a tricky thing to do, but if you underline a section, that's fair game. And what you're trying to establish by doing this sort of reverse analysis as you answer the questions is, should I have marked more? Did I mark too much? Was this necessary? Did I essentially undersell it or underdo it? Also, did you mark the right things? And did you mark the right things? Yeah. Yeah, but this is a calibration exercise. And let's let's also throw this caveat in there. Sure. Don't be a jerk about it. Don't, Don't underline the whole passage and right. be like, oh, I, I, I underline the whole thing. A jerk? This That's is... what you would call it? I would, all right. <laughs> uh, you know what I would say, say don't in... cheat don't you know don't cheat um or don't don't behave in a way that is inapplicable to the way that you believe you would behave on the actual thing look if somebody wants to cheat on this they right? can go ahead and do it it won't right. affect me it'll affect you so if you if you <laughs> want to you know, kind of cheat yourself you do that <laughs> but uh, the joke will be lost on me. Right. So just do it the way you would do it. Don't all of a sudden say, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to like underline or highlight or make notes about 25 to 35% more of this passage than I would. Don't right. go overboard. Do it the way that you would think you would do it during the actual test. But push the boundaries. Sometimes do less and see if you can survive it. Sometimes do more and see if that's actually beneficial. The, the only way. <laughs> I, I find this in social situations. The only way to know where the line is for you is to cross it. I would say cross it after you've actually successfully, you know, gotten a good baseline. Like this is the way I think I should do it. Do that on three or four passages. Then it, if you think that, all right, I'm seeing things that I don't like or I want to change, depends on your performance. Right. Then you can start kind of like fooling around with what's actually happening and changing it up a little bit. It's so. funny that you put it in such a like casual term, but the truth is that's exactly how you want to be about this. Fool around, experiment, play with it. Do way too much, do way too little, because you have to find where it is within those ranges, within that boundary that your particular success lives. Let's, let's be honest. There are students out there who are reading a paragraph and they're writing several sentences about it. Mm -hmm. And that's great. That works for them. There's a student right next to them who has read it and they haven't written a th single thing down. Now, when you have that degree of variation in people taking the test, what it tells you is that if somebody comes in and says there's only one way to read this, right. they're lying or they're trying to sell you something <laughs> and they are full of it. So, we're here to tell you, look, you have to adjust your reading and your abilities to the test as much as possible, but you also have to know where the lines are with that. These help you discover where you have weaknesses. They help you discover where these lines are. So fooling around with it is exactly the term. Yeah. Mess, playing around, messing around, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you experiment are is what yourself. I would probably call it. But yeah. Well, totally, yeah, it's totally fair. Um, that's a funny way to put it, and, and you make a really good point. And I kind of want to double down on this is be infinitely wary of any company that tries to tell you or sell you a system, a single way of doing reading comprehension, because that is not the way that that particular section of this test works. In my opinion, me, you have to adapt it to who you are, how you me, read, how you process. But you and I, again, I mean, we're, I, I, I'm just going to say equally good at this test, but we do the test differently. Mm hmm let me let me kind of expand on that point. Sure. Everybody just groaned. No. Oh, God, move on. But no, because by all means expand. I, I actually take some issue with the idea of like, oh, if somebody's trying to teach you a system. No, no, there's nothing wrong with a system. What I'm against is rigidity right. in that system. That I, says I should have emphasized the A system. Yeah, there's only one way to do this. Right. It's my way or the highway. <laughs> We see this with logical reasoning where we talk about reading the question stem first or reading the stimulus first. Our general approach is to read the stimulus first. But on a prior podcast, we discussed the idea of reading the question stem first. And as we put in our courses and books, I said quite clearly, we think the better way to do it is to read the stimulus first. We explained why that is. There are multiple excellent reasons that support that. However, if you as a test taker are not performing well with that, Try it the other way. Yeah. That's flexibility. The system says this is the way a lot of people who are really good at this test are able to do it. We think it will help you. 
the flexibility says, but if it's not working for you, try it a different way. So anyone who says, you've got to do this, man, be careful with that. I just yeah. don't buy that because people are different. And then as soon as you ignore that fact, you go down these roads where somebody's just telling you in almost a messiah-like tone, <laughs> this is the only way to do it. I'm like, mm-hmm, spare me. I don't like to suffer fools that way. <laughs> All right. So anyway. No, I'm, I'm glad you expanded on that point because I, it's a worthwhile one to emphasize. But that to me is the diagramming test and the nature of what it is. Try some passages where you don't mark a thing. Try some passages where you mark a ton. But really lean on those diagrams after the fact and see exactly what they gave you. That's the yeah, trick. And, and I want to add that to me, what you diagram is really front and center here. Mm -hmm. I want to see, and again, when I say diagram, I mean mark in the passage. Notations, yeah. Make notes on the side. What I want to see is, did you consistently hit elements that they asked about? Or were you notating stuff that just never came up? Because how close you are, and your overlap's never going to be 100%, no. but how close you are is really important because you have to make sure that you're looking for the things that they're going to ask you questions about. That is a skill that you can develop. I've seen people read comp passages for the first time and they're like, I have no idea. And then after they've done like 30 or 40, they start to say, I see kind of what's happening. Yeah. And we'll talk about, see how they keep asking about these conflicts, these different viewpoints. It becomes predictable. 100% predictable? Yeah. No. No, but there's no. a profound clairvoyance that is yes. learnable in this. I, I, I stress this in classes that I teach, and I know I've mentioned it on the podcast before, I'll say it again. One of the most useful things that I ever did for myself in reading comprehension was reverse engineer the passages, which is after I've done a passage, before I move on to the next thing, not in a full testing environment, but like as a practice, I would look at the questions and I'd be like, where did this come from? And some are passages as a whole, and they're not terribly indicative. Main point, all right. Something where it's like, which of the font does the author mention as a reason behind, you know, the escalation of sales tax or whatever? You're like, that was the second half of paragraph three. Being able to recognize those elements within a passage because they were asked about, after the fact even, is remarkably informative for the next time you read a new passage because it teaches you what to expect. It feels, after a time, as you get good at this, like you've been handed the teacher's edition, the annotated version of the LSAT. That's okay. how I feel when I look at it now. I'm like, they're going to ask about that. This is all garbage. They're going to ask about that. I bet they'll ask about that twice. Here's a list. Oh, oh yeah. All right. We're going to go on a total sidebar. Do it. <laughs> you've heard me talk about this before, and I mean, it is sidebarable. It is. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull it into something I was doing recently. Okay. But it's going to begin with a question that will appear to have nothing to do with reading comprehension, and we will get back to it, I swear. <laughs> If you were to look at all the television shows that you've ever watched, which uh -huh. one do you think your favorite is? Uh, um, Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, probably. That Again. is an insincere answer. <laughs> I, I've never seen an episode of that. Uh, I just had lunch next to her and her her gay husband's dog. Uh, I Wait, who are you talking about? The, uh, Vanderpump. Her husband is not... Ken? He... What are you talking about? No? No, dude. You think he likes that dog for real? All right. Uh, anyway, yeah, Look, they were I don't like a, the dogs, but that, <laughs> They were sitting no. at a table next to me, and he was- I think Ken and Lisa are all good. Ken used to uh, be he was like the, uh, the playboy. He was French poodle or whatever it was. <laughs> oh, I, they're terrible. Okay. Yeah. I have no further judgment. Um, what's my favorite television show of all time? I'm going to say Breaking Bad because I feel like that's fair enough. Okay. I don't know. I don't watch TV, really. Which well, I mean, I mean, like That's Schitt's Creek, for douche, example. Douchebag thing to say, but yeah. I do yeah. like Schitt's Creek, yeah. See, all of a sudden, it turns out you no, do like No, it's all coming back to me. All right. <laughs> yeah. It's a tough question to be asked on, on the thing. On the spot. Um, and I was, for me, it would probably be The West Wing. I've never seen an episode. That's rather regrettable for you. <laughs> okay. Um I think that's one of the greatest TV shows ever written. And the guy who wrote it, Aaron Sor Sorkin. It's Sorkin's is, a genius. So, He's a genius. He's enough. great with dialogue. And some of the dialogue in that TV show is fantastic. Anyway, continuing on, <laughs> I was watching Shonda Rhimes talk about screenwriting. And she said in the middle of it, she goes, well, when I was first starting, 
I would take episodes of television shows that I liked. And she says, for me, The West Wing was my favorite TV show. And what I would do is I would get the script and then I would sit down and I would watch the TV show and I would break down every little thing that happened. Okay. Uh, when the characters talked, what they said, how they closed out story arcs, how they started this scene, whether it was interior or exterior, all these different things. And she said, that was the best thing I could have ever have done because what I was doing was carefully analyzing how something was put together. Now, what you just said prior to my <laughs> incredible sidebar was the idea yeah. of like, I'm deconstructing you know, how they made this and what they're doing right. and how they're trying to like, kind of like catch me. This type of process applies to so many things in life. Mm -hmm. And of course it applies to the LSAT. That's what these kind of like diagnostic tests are for. They're just different ways of doing it in a formalized manner. You and I have done this naturally because as teachers, we know we're going to get asked questions about stuff that no one else has thought about. So we damn well better know each problem inside yeah. and out. Yeah, we deconstruct these things to this degree because it's self-preservation in a way. It's it's preparatory. But that's what yeah. I think any student who really wants to understand this test needs to do as well, and I'm, I'm sure that's your point. That is my point, is that deconstruction that you're talking about is something that is not foreign. It's not something that you're incapable of doing. You have the text of the LSAT in front of you. You know a lot of the concepts, especially if you've, you know, used one of our courses or books or what right, have you. Right. You can actually break it down and slowly draw out the consistent things that they are doing. Yeah. I mean, if, if we really want to take this to its most fundamental level, the reason that you and I have this business is because this test is so well repeated, so recognizably consistent that it becomes vulnerable to this type of deconstruction. And yeah. people don't seem to look at it through that particular lens, that optic. And as soon as they start to, and a lot of these tests, I think, give you the, the very clear architectural tools to then you begin to see that, wait, I can, I can beat this thing based on its own, you know, thin veneer. Yep. By the way, probably my second favorite TV show would be South Park. <laughs> That's actually a very fair. Um, Shonda Rhimes, does she do? Um, what was she? Probably met, she um, is the one behind Grey's Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She just sold her house right behind me. Actually, her house is like. 500 yards from me, I think. She just sold it. Well, she probably lives on the mountaintop in Beverly Hills now. I think now she moved she up to Bel Air. She, wants. she moved up to Bel Air, yeah. I think she did, like, <laughs> How to Get Away with Murder, too, but I've never seen that. There's another one with Kerry Washington, I think she did. But yeah. anyway, we're Scandal, really perhaps. spiraling down to... Yeah. Either tangent. way, she's an extremely accomplished uh, screenwriter, and it was just... She was, some, she was talking about writing, and she happened to talk about that, and I thought to myself, that is absolutely fascinating. Yeah. So then you mentioned it, and there we go. There we and are. That's what makes life fun. <laughs> Tangents. Let's, Tangents let's, do make life fun. Let's um, move on here. Let's get to the next test. Yeah, yeah, because there's still quite a few to go. Um, there's several happily. more. Mm -hmm. This is called the comprehension test. And really what it is, is it's a way for you to understand whether or not you're retaining what you read and whether or not you're actually clearly you know, understanding it. Right. So... What you're going to do here is you're going to take a passage and you're not going to put yourself under some kind of heavy time limit. My favorite part. I usually, yeah, this is just at your leisure in a way. I yeah, mean, don't, you know, you know, don't take 45 minutes, but. Exactly. I think plus five plus eight is probably yeah. pretty good. But you just go through this and you read the passage. Then at the end, all right. You write a short description of each paragraph. All right. So you're now summarizing it. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you move forward into the questions. You no longer look at the passage. You just use your written description to answer all the questions. Yeah. So let me break this down. This is really a three-step process as I see this particular um, drill. Uh, one, you read the passage. Take your time. Take five or six minutes to read the passage if you need to. Stop. Separate page. Write every paragraph out as best you can remember it as a summation, a Cliff's Notes. 
and then put the passage aside and do the questions based off your notes. That's really how this goes. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. Perfect. So your summarization, what we often call paraphrasing, this is critical. It's a critical skill in logical reasoning. It's a critical skill in reading comprehension. When you read something, you need to be able to put it into your own terms so it's clear to you, so you can absorb the idea. Because we all know that the people who write this test will, in many cases, use this crazy language and these long run-on sentences to drive you nuts. Well, what is this doing? This is saying, how well can you actually describe that? And how good is your kind of like understanding of what you actually read? Now, typically what should happen here is your performance on the big picture questions like concept reference and global reference, they should, it should be strong. Will you miss some specific reference kind of localized questions? Yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. I can live with that because you're not going back to the passage to confirm. So if you like do a question, you're like, oh, I could, I could answer this if I could just look at the lines. Don't worry about that. That's not what we call a notable miss or yeah. an informative miss. If anything, I, I think you've more or less achieved the goal if you're like, if I could just look at the first two sentences of paragraph four, I would get this question right. Mission accomplished as far as yep. I'm concerned. Then at that point, you know that you have you know taken in the passage as a whole. But this will give you a really good sense of whether or not you understand what you read and whether or not your recollection of what was central to the passage matches what the test makers think was central in the passage. Yeah. If anything, I, I think you could probably retitle this almost like the relay test, which is to say, imagine someone who hadn't read it is sitting next to you on a park bench or at a dinner table or on a couch, and you're like, here's what I just read. Do you want to hear about it? And you could Perfect. walk them through it. That, to me, is the type of broad understanding that you would want to be able to convey. I think that's a good description. I like that relay test. Yeah, that's kind of what this is. Let's move to the next one. All right. You want Which to is run very different. And one of my favorites, something that unfortunately gets well overlooked. Um, I wrote a thing in the latest edition of the Reading Comp Bible about um, essentially like speed versus comprehension or speed versus comfort. Um, and this is all about speed, the speed test. Take it away. I love this. You're not going to give yourself extra time. You're going to use the number of questions as your time, and you are going to bomb your way through this jetpack, which is simply to say, go as fast as you can, push yourself to the outer limits of comfort, beyond comfort, and see how you do. And let me make note, if you have a passage that has five questions, you have five minutes to read the passage, make any usual notations that you would, and then do all five questions. Yep. You are now moving as quickly as you possibly can, which is, that's, that's, that's speed. So that's a speed test that's right it, there. That's it, man. Yeah, it's <laughs> jetpack, like I said. Um, there's someone who's literally lit fireworks in your shoes. You got to go. So... I don't want to rank, I'm sure you don't either, Dave, but I don't want to rank these tests in terms of their utility, but there is an awfully strong <laughs> compulsion in me to rank this as the most valuable. Because I think what most people do is they read at what they find to be their comfort zone. And what they never do is they never push themselves to extend their comfort zone or, or to live on the edges of it, you will do better than you suspect with this kind of time pressure. I promise. I don't want to rank them because for one person, this is by far the most useful one. And for somebody else, it's the fifth most useful. And somebody, yeah, somebody else needs to slow down, frankly. So here's the thing that, you know, that I think is the caveat here. You're going to miss questions. If you can do the speed test and get them all right, ultra power for you. <laughs> All right, that is really important. But if you cannot, that's completely normal as well. But that's not what these tests are about. These tests aren't necessarily about, did you get everything correct? These tests are about really figuring out where to position yourself on the, you know, the grand Ferris wheel of reading comprehension. I need to go faster. I need to go slower. I need to diagram more. I need to diagram less. I'm reading for too big a picture understanding or I'm reading for too much detail. All of these things are about recalibration. It's litmus. 
It is, but one of the huge advantages here is that this really gives you a great sense of your true pace. Yeah. How fast can you go? How fast can you push yourself before the cracks become just ridiculous and you're just missing yeah. far too many questions? Undeniable, inevitable, right. Um, most people, I think, though, will find that they can read at a faster speed uh, than they're currently allowing themselves to read at. Um, I, I read a thing the other day, speaking of sidebars, Another thing the other day that essentially talked about the the duality, the double nature of how it is that we tend to read text. And I'm certainly guilty is a strong word, but I, I'm certainly uh, vulnerable to this. That on the one hand, I read a lot of text as though I'm going to speak it to someone. So I hear the words. I know you do this too because we talk for a living. I hear the words in my mind, like an audio book almost. But if I really want to read something fast, that's not the way I read. I've trained myself to read in images. So I don't hear the words, I just see and, and internalize them. I can read blocks of text, which is why, you know, five, six hundred words a minute you can read. But I think, yeah, a, yeah it's true. Um, but they're very different stylistic approaches to how it is that you take in uh, words on a page. You know, interestingly enough, that reminds me of the LSAT question about synesthesiacs, where they mix up their, uh, know, their yeah. senses. That's right. I know this question. <laughs> it's funny that it yeah, flashed you, but yeah, I know it. That was first, as soon as you said, I'm now thinking about it, not in an audio or oral sense, but in a visual sense, I was like, synesthesia. Here, so here's the way that I tend to, to move through really text in general, but if it's something that appeals to me, I read in chunks. I read big picture textually very, very fast. I don't hear it. I just like consume it, basically. Um, I gulp it. You turn it into a movie in your head. Basically. If it's something that I know I'm either going to struggle with or that I really want to process, I read it as though I'm presenting it like Richard Burton doing Shakespeare, like Olivier, where I'm like... Use your memory only. Like it's very <laughs> florid and, and elaborate. But if you read a reading comp passage that way, it will stay with you. So I, I encourage sometimes students to be like, read this as though you're going to present it in a, a very like Shakespearean Hampstead stage kind of way, like you're doing some London theater. Read it that way. John's offering a new personalized Patreon service. Yes, where I'll record your voicemails. I'll record your Mother's Day. If you, if you pay Day. a sufficient amount, he will read reading comprehension passages to you That's as right. uh, Lawrence Olivier or Richard Burton. And you pick your Welsh accent. <laughs> Burton's was too good. I, I wish I had a voice like Richard Burton. My God. Uh, I could woo Elizabeth Taylor twice as he did. Was it twice or three times that he just, married her? Just the two. He talked himself out of number three, thank goodness. Or he drank himself out of number three. Poor Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> Poor Elizabeth Taylor. She drank more than he did. Poor Richard Burton. He bought her the know. most expensive jewel in the world, man. I think she was rather unhappy. So I think she was an unhappy person. Yes, that's why I said poor Elizabeth Taylor. Um, anyway, we're not going to debate the merits of Elizabeth Taylor. Again, most people listen to this. At some, like, point, that? at some point, I'll just, we'll do a, a total sidebar issue, an after hours kind of thing. And I'll just tell you stories about Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor for 45 minutes. If we want to talk about like crazy stories of old Hollywood stars. I've, I've got them. That. I've got them. The Errol Flynn's of the world. Yeah, he was a maniac too. <laughs> they were all maniacs. That was actually the culture yeah. at that point. Peter O'Toole was an animal. I love it. Who is I? I was reading about somebody and it's going to come. Oh, we're doing it. Well, I didn't think. Well, okay. <laughs> well, no, I was just going to say he had docu he'd been married, I think, three or four times and he, he had documented over 196 affairs during this period of time. It was. The amazing thing is that doesn't begin to narrow it down. It was ridiculous. That could be Richard Harris. That could be it was not. Oliver Reed. That could be Robert Mitchum. That could be any of them. It was. It was. And that, everyone who's listening to this is like, he's named six celebrities I've never heard of. Now we have to look it up and figure it out. Maybe <laughs> I can find it by the end of this. I, I will attempt to figure out who it was. I but hope it's Richard Harris. He's got some It is not Richard him. Harris. Right. I would know the name immediately. Um, For you youngsters out there listening to this, Richard Harris played um, Gandalf. No, not Gandalf. Uh, 
Dumbledore. Dumbledore, a different wizard in the first two Harry Potter movies. And then he <laughs> died, sadly, of uh, lymphoma before the third. He, he died after the first movie and then was replaced. No, he was in the second. He died before the third movie. And okay. called the director from his hospital bed and said, if you replace me, I will kill you. And then he died. No. Hmm, how does that work? <laughs> yeah, I don't, it was, I don't think it was a threat taken too seriously. Anyway, to close off that ridiculous sidebar, <laughs> he documented hundreds of affairs that he'd had in his journal and then his son went out and published a book about it all. And I was like, that must have been weird. That's hey, amazing. Dad, he only had, he had under 200. So he really was pretty faithful. Okay. I mean, in the grand, <laughs> in the grand scheme. <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that either. <laughs> I mean, I'm saying I'm I'm very monogamous, but those guys weren't. I know. I think one affair is a lot. So, like 196 seems um, outrageous. Does anyway, a, does 196 seem like a lot more than 140? They both seem like, like huge wait, numbers. What point have you crossed the line where it's just like now it's just affairs? Like I'm gonna look this up. Okay. Wait, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> I gotta find out who it was. We'll add a footnote to the end of this. Um, oh, darn it. Yeah. Well, speaking of affairs, the speed test is uh, a very valuable exercise. And if anything, I think what it encourages you to do, you see how I just completely rein that in? Yeah, totally. It encourages you essentially to push your limits to realize where those limits live, where they are. Maybe it's not 196 affairs. Maybe it's only 82. But the speed test will tell you. It's all relevant. All right. Yeah. I'm still trying to find out. Uh, I know. I, know. I can tell you're actually Googling right now. I have to. I'm just really irritated level. by the fact that I can't. Let me let me then move on to a test, and I, I can handle this on my own. You do your thing. Um, <laughs> I hope what you're Googling right now is actor 196 affairs, as though that number is so specifically relevant. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't. <laughs> no, it's no, not I, right at I, all. I think I figured out the connection of how to get to it, uh, so I... I All have right. to go through that. Let me let me talk about something that is one of my absolute favorite. Uh, I actually wrote this as part of the latest edition of the Reading Comprehension Bible. So anyone who's purchased the 2020 edition uh, has access to this chapter or this set of pages. Uh, it's something that I have titled the Prediction Test. And this is easily combined with other things. This does not live um, in its own bubble. But I would say do the standard 2 plus timing plus two timing, so seven questions, nine minutes, that kind of thing. But here's what you want to do. After you've read the passage, you've diagrammed it the way you intend, you've pushed yourself via speed, you're considering your comprehension and how well you understand the big picture elements of a reading comprehension passage. You can summarize, hopefully, paragraph to paragraph, etc. You've done more or less all the things we've talked about. Stop. Take a break. Pause before you move to the questions proper. And begin to, as best you can, predict what it is that you think you will be asked. Sometimes this is best accomplished by a bracket in the passage. Sometimes you might be able to write out a question stem itself. The author offers which of the following is evidence for the harms of gray marketing. And you're like, I know there was a two-part list at the end of paragraph three. They're going to ask me about that, I bet. You can write that question. This is the prediction test. See how well you can anticipate the questions that you feel are likely to occur on the heels of a passage. This, uh, and it can feel wayward at times. It can feel a bit misguided, like you're shooting without a scope. It can feel that way. But I promise you, the more you do this, and the more you then readjust your anticipations to the reality of what you are asked, the better you will get at seeing the future. And this is one of the most powerful things that, personally, I was able to do for myself. I can read a passage now and tell you what five of the seven questions are going to be, more or less reliably. I think you probably can too, if I really put your feet to the fire, Dave. It varies. Yeah. Sometimes it's you know, more accurate than others, but a lot of times the idea is you're reading something do I think they're going to ask me about this? Because if they are, or you feel like the chances are high, spending a little more time there and making sure that you got it right is then really good policy. Yeah. It just, it, it 
really grounds you. There's a certain degree of like gravity, orbital gravity, to the fact of like the passage talked about these things, but not all of them mattered equally. It changes your ability to prioritize the hierarchy of the text. And that is such an incredibly useful skill that most people never, sadly, recognize is even available to them as they read. And notice that a test like this, by its very nature, you're going to have some passages where you're really good and other passages where you're not. That variability is okay. You're not looking for perfection. I mean, if you can get it, fantastic. (laughs) But that's not the actual expectation here. The idea is to start thinking along the lines of how they think. Because when they look at a passage, they're immediately thinking to themselves, we could ask a question about this, I could ask a question about that. So you want to get into that particular mindset and kind of take it from there. I mean, this is true of the the test as a whole. What is it that they're really trying to measure or have you demonstrate by putting this on the page in front of you? And that's a lot of what these tests are, are designed to really have you begin to consider the architecture, the the machinations of what underlies the content itself. Excellent. So that's the prediction test. And you know what? If you suck at it, keep doing it. You will get better. But recognize why you maybe prioritize things that you shouldn't have or failed to prioritize things that you should have, that they prioritize. This will make you a better reader by default. Well, there you go. There you go. In the meantime, I figured yeah, out who it was. I can tell. I can tell you're eager to get onto whatever you're googling has just turned up. Enough for even comp. What have you got? I'm so happy to have figured it out because if there's one thing I hate in the world is like these. I know the answer, but yeah. then I don't know the answer. Oh, God, age is brutal. What do you got? Yeah, the answer is Glenn Ford. I don't even know who that is. You would if you saw him. But he had a lifelong affair with Rita Hayworth, who was considered like one of the bombshells of of the 40s and 50s. And uh, apparently they had houses next to each other. I thought he was a producer and a director. I didn't know that Glenn Ford – I do know who that is actually. I didn't know he was an actor. Oh, gosh. He acted in all sorts of things. Really? Okay. So anyway, I just found that interesting to be like, all right, this guy apparently – The saddest part is right now there's a listener somewhere who's like – my great grandfather was alive in the forties. <laughs> you know, those who forget history are doomed to repeat doomed it. Repeat it. Uh, old Hollywood is an interesting, interesting animal. Having known some Hollywood actors uh, yeah. on a personal level, I've always found them to be unusual. It's yeah, they're, they're a whole different breed. Um, living here is very. Uh, it's informative in a way that I didn't know I needed to be informed. If yeah. That, if that makes sense. And obviously, I lived in, in uh, West LA for years. Yeah, so. you've got actually more time in the city than I do. Yeah. But just kind of an interesting thing to, to run against. Yeah, Glenn Ford. Glenn Ford's got his Hollywood you know, Walk of Fame star someplace out there. Which I strongly encourage anyone who ever has the chance to visit the city uh, to avoid. <laughs> It's worthless. It's so gross. <laughs> that area of town's not exactly my yeah, favorite. Skip right past it and hike Runyon Canyon or something, but don't don't walk the walk. Now that's a good time. Yeah. Um, All right, are we ready to move on to the prephasing? Yes. Phrasing test? Yeah. Yeah. Prephrasing test. Uh, this is another one that I uh, was fortunate enough to be able to add to the latest edition of the RCB, um, and it, it really, to me, is the flip side of the coin of the prediction test of the last one. Which is the reverse engineering idea. Again, it can be combined with other tests, but it it really comes down uh, to your ability not just to predict the questions, but to then predict the answers to the questions. So it's a a natural, I think, follow through, um, evolutionary next step, as it were. Here's how I used to do this. And I do this in logical reasoning too, by the way. Um, In fact, in many ways, arguably, it's a better use in logical reasoning. Certainly it's valuable in both. What I would do is I would take a reading comprehension passage set and I would cover every set of answer choices, A through E, with a post-it note or notes, plural, as needed. But I would hide them from myself. 
And I would go through, and on top of those post-it notes, I would write down what I expected the answer to either be or reference. Sometimes it'd just be like line 42. Or mention something about the nature of what the right answer choice was going to contain or come from. And what I would do after the fact, again, not terribly worried about time, mostly worried about accuracy. I would go back through and I would pull the uh, post-it notes off, stick them next to the answers, not read the question again, certainly not read the passage again, or logical reasoning stimulus again, and just using my notes, see if I could get the question right. And what I found over time is this made me remarkably good at anticipating the nature and the tonality, really the you used this phrase last time, the lingua franca, <laughs> of the test makers. I'd be like, they're going to say it this way. They're going to talk about this truth, this fact, this paragraph three detail this way. And when you start to think in the language of the test makers, you can do anything. That is true LSAT fluency. It's a beautiful comfort. Well, the more you think like them, the better off you are. Yeah. And I'll point out, that this is the kind of test that you can add on to the others. Exactly. You can mix and match some of this stuff. Some of them work really well together. It doesn't have to be like, I isolated each one and there was no similarity and I just did that one and I never looked at anything else. You can be like, well, I'm going to do this and this and see how it works out. Yeah. Just don't do it at first. Wait until you've actually done each one a few times. Yeah. If, if you're struggling in reading comprehension... These are the type of tools that you want to apply individually first. Later on, you can start combining them. Yeah, go fast and predict. Diagram like a maniac and cover answers with post-its and prephrase. You can start to group these things together. And what you will find eventually is that various elements of each of these tests speak to you. And cohesively you find that you have now developed a systematic approach to this section that is unbeatable. There's nothing the test makers can throw at you that you can't conquer. Look, if you're about to go into war, what's the thing you really want to do? You want to study your enemy. You want to know the tendencies of the enemy. I'm going to use this kind of like extremely aggressive, high testosterone, warlike analogy. (laughs) Be a general in a bunker. That's That's what I think I want to do. You know, okay. I want to pilot the drones. It's like that old Pink Floyd song. (laughs) Forward he cried from the rear as the front went down. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, I'm I'm the guy in the back. I'll hold the flag. Uh, Anyway, my point being that you, if you were to go into a war, you would want to know everything that your enemy was going to do. A test like this allows you to examine the enemy. And again, it's a figurative enemy. Sure. I, I, cons- I consider it more like a, you know, a playful battle. Sure. But at the same time, that's the idea. You are studying in a way what they're doing and then comparing it to what your perceptions and expectations are. And when you see deviation, that is useful. And when you get it right, that's useful. Mm-hmm. So there's a constant uh, cycle of information and feedback loop that is occurring as you go through a test like this. And that's just amazingly helpful. This is how you get better for yourself, not how someone else tells you how to get better. Well, yeah. Yeah, these are very self-assessing types of, of measures. But what these analytical metrics really do, in a way, is they allow you to understand how it is that you're interacting with the test and what the test is doing to you and what you can do to countermand it, frankly. Um, in a combative sense, what you can do to fight back. I love, love that about this, that there are hard measures to apply. There are specific steps to take, as opposed to just like, read faster. Like, ugh. Yeah, remember the main point better. Right. That's not advice. That's like, I mean, well, it yeah, is, we, but... <laughs> that's a wish list for things that, you know, somehow materialize with no work. Yeah, in the same way that pleading the fifth is an answer to the question, but it's Horribly unhelpful. <laughs> to spout more lyrics, considering the Neil Peart discussion that we had okay. last week. Peart. I'm actually not sure. I always thought it was Peart. I know whatever. we talked about that last time, but yeah. Uh, if you choose not to decide, you still have you made, still a choice. made a choice. <laughs> so we can just keep on going with this all night long. I can tell anyway. you and I are both in an expansive mood. Maybe it's <laughs> <laughs> clearly. <laughs> 
<laughs> Should we talk about the one very briefly, the one final kind of summation of all of this? I mean, it's something we've touched on before, but if we talked about it in every single podcast episode, I still don't think we'd do it enough justice. Okay. It's something that you and I have titled the teaching test. You want to yeah. elaborate? Yeah, we have referenced it repeatedly, and it is something that um, I have said previously. I'll put students on the spot to do, mm-hmm. not in front of a whole class. <laughs> I'm not that I'm not that much of a jerk, <laughs> but I'll do it individually, um, just to see exactly how well they've understood something and whether or not they're really being honest with themselves about their level of comprehension. Competence. And the gist, yeah. What's up? And the gist of it comes down to the idea that. All right, if you really want to see whether or not you know all this stuff, go teach it to someone else who's never seen it. And teach it in a way that's not like halting or uncertain or kind of like bumbling or not really clear, but in a way that actually masterfully outlines everything, gives a nice picture of the passage and then breaks down the questions in a really fluid, cohesive manner, drawing it back to the main points. And the beauty of how this all works is that In order to teach something to someone else, you have to really master conceptually how the whole thing has been put together in the first place and then deconstruct the best way to have broken it down. Um, Yeah, you can't fake it at that point. Like you understand or you don't. And look, you and I, I think, pride ourselves on a degree of articulance that is, um, I mean, maybe I'll just say this for myself. Uh, it's, It's taken quite a long time, I think, for us to reach a point where we feel as though we can more or less explain anything in comprehensible terms. I'm not, when I tell people to teach something, whether to me or to a long suffering roommate or significant other or parents, it's not that you have to give the most eloquent soliloquy of, of how this would be. It's more, can you explain this in a way that someone who doesn't understand it at the outset grasps it by the end? Because if you can make someone else get it, you clearly do. That's what I care about. If you can answer their questions, their rebuttals, their confusions about answer choice B, which is wrong, you are a master of that content. You now know it. And you've proven that you know it. And having to actually explain that to others will then show you what the people who made the test are valuing. Mm -hmm. It's the ultimate proving ground, yeah. Yeah, it's the final summation. You can use all the prior tests that we talked about to show your own weaknesses, but still at the end of the day, that doesn't prove you knew what you were doing. Mm -hmm. This test will unmistakably reveal whether or not you have mastered it. There's no greater spotlight. Yeah, and it's the same reason that we tell people to do games multiple times. Mm -hmm. Because if you struggled the first time, how much do you struggle the second time or the third time? You need to go until you no longer struggle with it. You have to perfect your ability to do that game. Same thing whether it's you know logical reasoning. So this idea is kind of like the final linchpin, the keystone piece that says, I really do understand all of this extremely well, so well, in fact, that I can teach it to you and you're going to understand it as well as I did. Yeah. It becomes, I don't quote him often, as Mike Pence would say, uh, a pole star where it it's your new true north. This is, that's the objective that I'm, I'm leaning towards, that I'm aiming to. It's the first Mike Pence quote I've ever heard uh, yeah, there from you, go. you, certainly, and certainly on this podcast. <laughs> Probably. Well, don't get your hopes up for a second. <laughs> Unless, Unless he's start, our next president calling you mother. Yeah. <laughs> God, I've got so many things I want to say right now. And We're going to leave gonna, that alone. I'm not going <laughs> to. <laughs> anyway, yeah. that teaching test is something that we've talked about several times before. It's yeah. all over our materials. It's even on our blog that we talk it's about just it. It's invaluable, man. Like, I... You and I have seen students do this. The fourth time they do a game, they're like, oh, man, I forgot about that distribution. Or I forgot about tracking that block. And I'm like, do it again. And then yeah, you can't. do it again. You can't forget about it. This is, even in reading comprehension, like, oh, you know what? I didn't, I didn't recognize this alternative viewpoint came in down here at the end of the second paragraph. It's like, you can't miss that. I didn't realize the author gave two examples in paragraph four. You can't miss that teaching this stuff really reveals what other people will recognize in your own insufficiencies, inadequacies, 
Uh, and those are the things that sometimes are hard to self-diagnose. It's the ultimate prove it moment. Exactly. And it doesn't just extend to reading comprehension. You can take this to any concept. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times people will come into me and they'll say, oh, well, I'm really good at that. And I'm like, okay, yeah. go ahead and teach it to me. Dare I say it doesn't just extend to the LSAT. It, it really doesn't. But we'll keep it to the LSAT right now. <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, and that might be something as broad as conditional reasoning. Or I'll be like, give me the theory about how to do a parallel question. Yeah, or it might be something as narrow as an unless statement with a not in it. That's exactly right. Yeah. And what you often find is that the most difficult thing is to figure out where to start. And I'm willing to grant some latitude when I say, explain conditional reasoning to me. But for someone who's about to teach it, that's a huge subject with a lot of different pieces. Where do you start? Are you going to start with something that's really minor and kind of like a real piece, a detail piece? Or are you going to start with like, well, this is what the relationships are about. And then to start to explain that in a way that it unrolls clearly. So I can tell that you actually understand the hierarchy of importance of how those ideas work. So it's things like that. It's not just that you explained it. You explained it well. Right. That's the key to all of this. Comprehensibly. I think that probably wraps it up. I so. like it. Yeah. I think that's a really good place to, to put a pin in this. I'm just going to really quickly say, let's just look at the tests in – you know, just from a title standpoint. The first one we talked about, broad versus detailed reading test, you know, shows you your weaknesses on, uh, on what you're picking up. Then we had a diagramming test. How good is the diagram you're doing? Are you diagramming the right things? Then we had a comprehension test in terms of what you recall, your ability to write that down, how well you were able to understand what you read. Then a speed test, put yourself under pressure, see if there's any cracks, see how fast you can go, how comfortable you are with it. Then you had a prediction test in terms of trying to figure out the types of things that you're going to be asked and whether or not you really understand that and you can see where questions are coming from in the passage. And then last, we had a prephrasing test, which is, do you understand the way they're going to um, word answers and the ideas that they're actually going to focus on with individual questions? And then looming above all of that in our minds, at least, is the teaching test that says, <laughs> all right, irrespective of all that. Can you teach it to us? Yes or no? That's my bullet point one no, minute summarization. That's beautiful. I, I'm sure there's a lot of people listening to this right now. It's like, I wish they just led with that. Why didn't you guys do that <laughs> yeah, first so could've... I could stop? I could have been out of here an hour ago. And who's Glenn Ford, man? Who's talk Glenn about Brad Ford? Pitt instead. Right. Well, I can talk about that. You want to talk about Brad Pitt and sure. Jennifer Aniston and crossing paths and the world stopping? Uh, yeah. Well, do we talk about her dress? Probably not. <laughs> Probably shouldn't. Probably Again, should. that's a show topic for the after show. <laughs> <laughs> she's looking good at 50. Dude, she's Hat drinking tip. some magic elixir. Hat tip to Jen. Uh, yeah. I'm not even believing that stuff. No. Anyway. After show. I think that ends it. Any final comment? No. I, I'm glad we got a chance to, to get some reading comprehension into the mix, though. I know that there's a lot of people who've been um, pining for us to talk about this stuff. And well, and it's also something that's really cool. And like yeah. I said before, unique to, to PowerScore and what we do systematically in, in terms of how we teach this test. And so you shouldn't hear it elsewhere or they might hear from our lawyers. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, you will hear this elsewhere, but it'll be after the fact. And only <laughs> yeah, you will else, hear it eventually. Right, but. Someone else has glommed onto this. But uh, I'm glad we're the first of the punch. All right. Well, if you get a chance, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you may find it. Give us a rating as well. And if you have questions, please send those to LSATpodcast at powerscore.com. On behalf of John and myself, have a great week, and we will talk to you soon. <laughs>